Our reading this morning comes from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Hear these words. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone according to you, not to think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in accordance to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, and the compassionate in cheerfulness. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I thank God for our young people of this community that take a stand for Christ. I'm, I'm, I'm just amazed at what I see in our young folks and the growth that I see taking place in, our, in our, the youth of this church. It's ever harder to stand against the ways of the world. I, I can remember the pressures of, of being young and, and wanting to fit into the crowd somehow that you didn't, that you didn't stick out. Our young folks are, are bombarded daily with a, with a barrage of, of worldly things that will take them down the wrong path. Because I guarantee you there's plenty of witnesses in here and, that can testify that we, that we as older folks succumb to some of those temptations and we went down the wrong path for a period of time. Can anybody say amen to that? Surely somebody went down the wrong path for a while in this church. While our, our youth certainly need to hear, the, hear this message this morning, I believe it applies to every person in this place because the world is constantly at our door pressuring us in many ways into ungodly things to participate in ungodly uh, habits and, and things in our lives. And if, so if you can remember these words, they will sell, serve you well as you begin to deal with the circumstances that you're faced with daily and weekly. So this, this message is, is a response to the external pressures that are always present in our lives. The Spirit of God will not dwell where there's hatred and vengeance. I want to say that again. The Spirit of God will not dwell any place that there's a spirit of hatred and vengeance. Pastor James Harnish, he shared a, a wonderful illustration about with toothpaste and a balloon a few years ago, and I want to use that object lesson that he used uh, very, uh, uh, very well. And Pastor Harnish reminds us that there's some people that are squeezers and some people that are rollers, and it gets into some real marriage issues <laughs> some, so, sometimes. So I, I've got this little object lesson, and I guarantee you, you're going to be one of these people. You're either going to be a toothpaste or a balloon before you leave here this morning. And I want to show you, this is Colgate toothpaste. They didn't pay me a dime to do that. And I'm going to squeeze this out here. Now, I'm not interested in the, the toothpaste that come out, but what I want you to see is the tube itself. And I'm going to hang it up here. Do you see how malformed and disfigured the toothpaste tube is? That's what the world, that's what the world will do to you. And on the other hand, I have a balloon which represents us. And until the Spirit of God is in us, we're pretty lifeless and limp. There's just not a whole lot to that person. But when the Spirit of God blows into this, blows into us, we can know life and have it abundantly. I had somebody come out at the 9 o'clock and say, if you want to make it real interesting, do that with an onion sack. 
And <laughs> and I could probably do it. I just <laughs> so that lifeless nothing that I had in my hand a few minutes ago becomes empowered by the Spirit of God and gives us life. So you you got to watch about pins and balloons in the same place. Whether you want to admit it or not, that those those illust- that illustration, you come into this place this morning as one of those. You come squeezed by the pressures of the, of life and squeezed by all that's going on around you. You feel like everybody in the world's against you, and you feel like you feel like that, that just, you're just crushed by all that's happening in your life. Or you can come in filled by the Spirit of God. Or maybe if you come in this way, maybe you can go out that way this morning. Pastor Harnish goes on to write these words. He said, Paul has spent 11 chapters describing the amazing grace and mercy of God that meets us in our brokenness and sin. Grace that restores and forgives and renews us in a relationship with each other. The 12th chapter opens with that great therefore. Therefore, because of the way of God's love and mercy have made, been made known to us, because we have experienced God's grace and the cross, look at the way we should live in response to that love and grace. What powerful words from a colleague pastor that I wanted to share with you this morning. So the point of his object lesson, we can either be squeezed by the forces of the world or we can be empowered by the power of the Holy Spirit. We can be transformed, remolded, reshaped, redesigned with the wind of the Spirit of God working mightily in our lives so that the breath of the Holy Spirit is what gives us life and hope and strength and joy this morning. We live in a world of where peer pressure dictates a lot of our actions. I've been told if you go to a fish market, and, I, and as I said earlier, I, I recognize that with crawdads. I catch, used to catch a lot of crawdads on Huff Creek. But if you go to a fish market, they can have a big, a big vat of, of crabs, and they don't put a lid on top of those crabs. And it's not because the crabs can't fall out or crawl out. It's because every time one of them tries to crawl out of that, there's others that will pull them down and pull them back in. That's the pressure of the world around us. Every time we try to dig ourselves out of a hole, there's a lot of pressure and pulling, pulling back on us. So in fact, you can pick up one crab and you might have four or five because those four or five will hang on to that one. That's exactly how the world does this. That's what negative peer pressure does for us. That, that's what we must fight against. We have two pretty clear choices, to be squeezed by the external forces of the world or to be transformed by the infilling of the Holy Spirit. There's a thousand ways that the world will squeeze the squeeze the life out of you. I remember as a young man, I was both greatly affected, both negatively and positively, with, with the forces around me. And there was just some lifestyles that just never really appealed to me. And when my peers in high school in the 1970s, drinking and smoking, that was the big deal. Everybody that was on the in crowd, or at least that's what you thought, they'd sneak into their daddy's uh, booze or their daddy's beer or whatever they'd have, and they were drinking and smoking, and uh, drugs weren't nearly as big a problem. But, you know, I got through high school. I, I, I went through high school without any problem. I had my eyes on a blue-eyed little thing. <laughs> yeah, Sherry Lynn. And, and I had my eyes on her the whole time, and, you know, it kept me from a lot of trouble. And uh, so, so, so I, I made it through that part of my life where so many kids had, had fallen prey to, to alcohol and, and drugs and all of that. The pressure was still on. So even after I married, and I go to work at the mines, and, and, and I go and I'd come in. We, we got in a habit of coming in every evening with my supervisor. His name was uh, Jack. And uh, his name was Jack. Well, he had a bottle of Jack in his right drawer. And uh, Jack Daniels, that is. And uh, he had a bottle of Jack Daniels. And we'd come in every evening after a, after a hard day work, and we'd sit around the, that desk, and it just seemed like that, that Jack Daniels and Coke just kind of 
took the edge off of what was happening around me. And so I began to fall into that lifestyle after I was married, not, not before. It had always been, uh, and, and the minds at that time was going through a lot of transition. They were, there was a lot of pressure to hire women uh, in the workforce, which was a very male-dominated workplace. And, and, you know, you begin to put men and women together back on top of a mountain or back underground. Honey, you don't have to have a lot of imagination to think what happened, and it did. And I began to witness broken homes. I began to witness the chaos in folks' lives. So I began to feel that pressure as a 20-year-old young man, the 20-year-old man faced with the worldly pleasures and, and the world just caving in around me and, and trying to engulf me and trying to, trying to pull me back down into that, into that destructive lifestyle. And at that time, we were only attending church at Christmas and Easter, and, and uh, the church had, had, didn't have a whole lot for me at that point in my life. And, and Sherry, she, she could see that happening in my life. She could see that. Unknown to me, I didn't, I didn't recognize it. It's not like she fussed at me every day or anything like that. She began to notice that in my life, and she began working behind the scenes to get me out of that work environment. And the next thing you know, I get a job offer. And I change jobs. So I go from this very ungodly place that I'd been working, I go to this brand new coal mine. They prayed every time they went underground. I'd go up on the section and, and there would be a Bible scripture, a scripture on the boom of the roof bolter. Every place I looked was a reminder of God's presence and power at this new job. And I didn't find out about that for probably two or three years later. I didn't know that she was the source of, of me moving. God delivered me at a time when this was happening in my life. The pressures of the world were squeezing me into its mold and would have cost me everything I had, would have been extremely difficult and destructive on my life and the life of my family and the life of everybody I had in my world. The Lord began to prosper us after that, and it didn't take long that we began to spend more than we make. And I'm glad I was the only one that's ever done that. <laughs> and, and so the next lesson to learn was we begin to learn about debt. Debt is a major squeezer. I used to tell the story about somebody stealing my credit card, and I called him and told honey, just keep it. You're not putting near, on, near as much on it as Sherry it is. So, <laughs> ultimately, too much debt is a spiritual issue. It will squeeze the life out of you. It will squeeze the life out of your family. It'll squeeze the life out of who you are as a human being. When we're transformed by the breath of the Holy Spirit, the good and acceptable will of God will be, will be made known. It didn't take us very long to understand in our own relationship that debt was a cruel taskmaster. A cruel taskmaster. So we begin to think long and hard before we'd sign on the bottom line about something that we wanted. Because if we let it, the world will shape your attitudes and your values. If you let it, the Lord will shape the, the world will shape your convictions from the outside in, and it'll squeeze the life out of you. The desire for more and better stuff was a quest that we were on, and it was destroying everything that was important in our lives. Stuff, stuff. Everybody knows what I mean by stuff, don't you? Everything from a jet airplane to a hamburger and everything in between is stuff. It'll, it'll, stuff will not fulfill your life. Stuff does not fulfill your life. It, stuff does not make you whole. It's easy sell for most people that what really matters can be bought or sold. But I learned better. What really matters in life cannot be, cannot be bought or sold. And we learned, we learned better quickly. I was reminded at the foundation dinner just last week about people who, who lived pretty ordinary work lives in their careers, but in many cases, they, when, they, when they left this world, they leave it with a considerable estate, although they'd never really made a lot of money. They weren't, they weren't very wealthy people in their lives, but what they had learned to do was to live within their means so they accumulated, accumulated wealth over their life. A few years ago, I, I began noticing a dangerous trend, and I've been talking about this for 25 years 
maybe longer, in popular media. And it's, it's a notion of, of, of what I call amorality. I was reminded in Judges 17 about a, about a time when there was no king in Israel. So Micah decided to just start his own religion. I call it backyard religion. Now this man Micah had a shrine and he, he made an ephod, which is a priestly robe and some household gods and installed one of his own sons as his priest. In those days, Israel had no king. Everybody did, everyone did as they saw fit. That's the world we live in today. Everybody making their own rules. Everybody doing as they saw fit. Most of us were born into a family of, that offered us a, a moral code based on the Ten Commandments. And so if we acted against that moral code, that meant you were immoral. The very notion of immorality was that was just going against the moral code, but you ha here's the point. You had a moral code. You, you may go against it, but you were just simply being immoral. Now there's a new morality that's the most rampant in our culture, and it's amorality, which means there is no moral code. It's whatever seems right or wrong in your eyes is right or wrong. We're all making our own set of rules for life. I challenge you to play a game of Monopoly like that. See how that goes out for you. So we have our own backyard religion we have our own homemade religion i used to love to tell the story about the baker who had uh, he had a sign up or uh, had these two apple pies sitting side by side and it said pies like your mom made five dollars pies like your mom thought she made ten dollars <laughs> i love it just because it's homemade don't make it better all the time don't make it don't mean it's better God has laid out for us a set of principles, a set of rules, if you will, that are very life-giving and life-restoring. Those rules are not meant to restrict, but to give life. Not meant to be restrictive at all. And the world will squeeze you into its mold of amorality every time, regardless of what you think, or I think about sin, the wages of sin is still death. You can have all the opinions you want. The wages of sin is death, regardless of what you think about it. So the bottom line for me, with the mounting pressure of the world to, to, squeeze, to squeeze us into the mold, is how does it teach you, how is the life you're living, how is it teaching you to believe in and to honor the risen Christ. Because at the end of the day, the Bible says to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all those other things that you yearn for and that you desire, He'll throw those in for good measure. Any other pursuit will come to no effect. Because every facet of our lives must exalt and glorify Jesus Christ. And when you put that first place in your life, I promise you, everything else it just, it just falls in the line. It just, it just does. It just works out. So the current mantra of many is what's in it for me. What's in it for me? It'll lead to a disastrous end. You can have your own church out back if you want. It's not the same as serving the risen Christ. You make your own set of rules and you do what you think's right, but understand there's a God that says different so that we may be living, that we may be a living and a breathing sacrifice and a witness with the renewing influence of God's Spirit working mightily in our lives. That's what it's about, church, to live lives that breathe the Holy Spirit. In other words, it's about the born-again experience. It's about God's grace transforming. It's about God's grace changing us for that, that we become the very expression of God to a hurting world. We're in the church and the world for transformation. Our mission is to be a tangible expression of the Holy Spirit of God in, the, in this community, empowered by the Holy Spirit to make love real to a hurting world. That's your mission in life. My call for mission for as long as, as long as I've been in ministry has been to love people till they ask you why. 
Love them wherever they are. Whatever, whatever hole they find that you find themselves, whatever muck and mire that they're down in, you go in and offer the love and grace of God wherever they are. And at some point, they'll ask you why. Why could you love me? And you get to tell them at that point. Love people till they ask you why. When people experience God's love and grace, they become great lovers, lovers of God. So the question for today, the question for today is the world squeezing the life out of you? Did you come here this morning feeling the pressures of the world all around you? Or are you being daily transformed by the power of the Spirit that you might be a, a, a witness, a living witness and sacrifice of the Holy Spirit? It's told along some of the roads in Alaska that are built on permafrost. Permafrost is all over the map. You can build a road on it, but it may go down two feet in one day. And, and so there's, they, they, they create ruts. So there's a sign in some of the places, I'm told, that it says, choose your rut carefully. You're going to be in it for several miles. <laughs> so the question for you this morning, will the rut that you're following lead you to a relationship with God? Will the rut you're following allow the Spirit of God to work within your life? so that you may be a reflection to a lost and a hurting world. And the last thought is, are you squeezed by the forces of the world or are you empowered by the Holy Spirit? Answer that question, and it will have been a blessing to be in the house of the Lord. Amen.